Well, today is going to be a step in a different direction for what we're going to talk about. Part of this is going to be forum-driven, and part of it is going to be informational. Now, for us as New Hope, there have been a couple of major changes over the last two years, personally, here within the congregation. One of them was very easy to recognize. It was the fact that we have gained some new members, new friends, and the other one was the addition of Bible studies that are directly linked to what the sermons are about and to doctrine. Now, doctrine, it's a significant thing. It can be frustrating. It can be time-consuming. It can be tedious. And it can be repetitious to deal and learn and function within doctrine. But in short, it is something we're commanded to deal with, and doctrine means that which I believe. Now, many people recognize that when you deal with doctrine, there can be arguments for and against certain things. There can be debates about the merits of something. Is it as important as this or not as important as that? Why is doctrine necessary? What would happen? Dave, go ahead. Uh, it's a guideline for the teaching. A guideline for the teaching. Nancy. Ooh, wow, we took the first step, and Nancy took the third step. Could it prevent something? Could doctrine prevent anything? Dave? It can prevent misbeliefs being uh, given out. It could prevent heresy from being taught or stepping into heresy. Now, when we, as New Hope, think of doctrine, our experiences tell us that doctrine is important because of the historical value of doctrine, but we also understand that doctrine changes. Now, what is the big difference between the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the New Testament, the New Covenant? Eileen. Okay, Eileen said that most don't participate in the celebrations of the Old Covenant in a direct way. Uh, the Day of Atonement, uh, the Feast of the Tabernacles. That was replaced by the presence of Jesus Christ and the fact that we should live in the mindset of a Sabbath seven days a week. We should live in the mindset of celebrating those days that referred to God. And as the, uh, the communion message stated, the promises. Uh, there's a difference there between Jesus lived, breathed, and taught in the New Testament, and he was alluded to in the Old Testament and foretold and promised. Now... If a church was really going to be on task, be on focused point, and what I mean by that is task is a job, doing your job, but on a focused point would be we have to come up with this result and we'll do it by doing these things, and when we get that result, we can say we succeeded. What are the two things, one of many things, that a church does. Um, let's just think about this very casually for a minute. Give me two things a church does. Nancy. Care for its members. Ooh, care for its members. What about provide a, an opportunity and an environment for worship? 
would about provide education and uh, nurturing for people spiritually. Dave, you had a thought? Uh, it gives people a chance to serve as well. To, ooh. Now, what are all those things connected to and about? They are about worshiping God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Pastor Joe, some years back, wrote an article on doctrine, and one of the statements he makes is this. Ideally, churches would offer both discipleship classes and sermons. The classes would be more doctrinal and explanatory with opportunity for questions and discussion. They'd be geared towards specific groups such as Christians, teenagers, preteens, and others. Now, if that's geared towards Christians, would it make sense that another group would be non-Christians? That that would be geared towards? It would. Then the sermons could be shorter, Joe says, with more of a motivational orientation based on a short passage of Scripture. Now, why would shorter sermons be mentioned here by Joe? Bill knows the answer. I think Dave does too. <laughs> because sermons customarily for us years ago were 90 minutes and sometimes even longer. And the attention span of people evaporates after about 45 minutes. Now, if you have a sermon that's 30 to 45 minutes long and you have a discipleship time, the two are linked. And they're linked because you want common flow. You want common uh, directions and you want to have unification between that which is spoken from here and that which is spoken at the discipleship table. Now, my desire is that we move away from the term Bible study only because it has become a four-letter word to many millennial people, and by that we mean the current age of 30-somethings. It has become a blighted statement for Christianity, and when you say discipleship, it conjures up new meaning. Now, in that idea of bringing up new meaning, one of the things that we're trying to do based upon a time some years back, uh, some of you weren't here to experience this, but Randall took the time to educate us, train us, lead us through some scenarios and some make-believe experiences that took us to the place of recognizing if we were going to go forward, did we go this way or that way or that way over there? And we came up with the understanding that some things had to change, some things had to become uh, more intentional, if you would. In that, we chose a direction, a sense of value. And one of the things that we chose was to focus on packaging the story of the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ, the Father's plan and the Holy Spirit, to package that in a way and deliver it in a way that attracts someone's attention. That becomes a, what was that you just said, moment for people. Now, in doing that, you can get into all kinds of problems and frustrations. You can upset one person because you used a certain description to uh, wrap up a conversation about communion, the bread and the wine. You can turn around and get somebody else so thrilled because you talk about the absolute unconditional love of Christ and that when we take communion, the mindset is at the foot of the cross watching the blood run and seeing his last breath. There are all these reactions and they all come down to 
doctrine. Everything that a Christian does should be based on foundational beliefs. And I would go so far as to say foundational belief statements. One of the things we don't want to do, we don't want to leave the door open for heresy. We don't want to allow it to be spoken and then look back and say, gee, I wish I hadn't allowed that to happen. We don't want to be in a position of saying, you know what? I was warned about this and I didn't take the time to look after this and protect the flock. Now in the early church, when we go back in the Old Testament, back to the time of Christ and then coming forward through the time of Paul, the early church developed a list of doctrines they felt were essential for new believers to know and ex accept. Can you give me one of those doctrines? What would be one of the new beliefs that the early church would have adopted? Dave? The resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus. It's interesting that you didn't say the crucifixion and you said the resurrection, because the resurrection is the end of the sentence. And then we understand the ascension and being with the Father. As I said before, doctrine refers to I believe in the Latin. Now, in the old church, as the church was growing and evolving and becoming functional and becoming relative to the people that uh, were around the old church, the doctrines that came out were actually different in one city than they were in another city. Now, there were certain standard truths that existed. Jesus Christ was the Redeemer, the Savior, the Grace Giver, the Mercy Bringer. But there were other things that weren't perfectly focused and on point yet. And as time went forward, those doctrines became homogenized down to some very basic things. Um, can you remember the phrase and recognize the phrase, the phrase, the Apostles' Creed? I think we all know that phrase. What about the Nicene Creed? Some of us know that, some don't. As the church came forward, the doctrine evolved. The doctrine was discussed. The merits of it were argued. The importance of things was argued. And we come forward now where in our time, in our day, in our church here, if we look at our statement of beliefs that's posted on the New Hope website, one would notice it is a clone of what's on the denomination website. We haven't really sat down to take the time to develop our own phrases and descriptions and language for those core beliefs. Now, in today's society, doctrine is is problematic for some people because it conveys Catholic, Catholic, yeah, being Catholic, thank you, Catholicism. It can convey being Presbyterian or Methodist or Episcopal or this or that. And the idea is to kind of move more towards a basic statement of beliefs. Now, a basic statement of beliefs, some would call the tenets of their faith. Now, in this, there are very, very core doctrines or tenets of faith. Has anyone ever heard the core doctrines of the Christianity that we represent? Has anybody ever read them? A couple of us have. We would sum them up by saying, we believe. Now for us, Grace Communion International, the statement of beliefs was so long that it was problematic to deal with in conversation. 
because the conversation wound up being a long one. And so the goal of part of the theology team for Grace Communion International was to render down those core belief statements to a handful or two hands full of things that could be used to describe who we are, who we are for, what we do, and this is how we do it. Now, in talking about what we believe, if we were to say we believe in or that pertaining to the Trinity, what might that be? Just think about that. You don't have to answer it. But what might the words look like when we say we believe in the Trinity? And what has come to exist after it has been refined and studied and refined and studied some more is this. We believe in one holy, loving, all-powerful and gracious creator, God, who exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Doesn't that sound awfully simple and basic? It is, but it describes the God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Another thing, we believe that the Bible is the inspired and infallible Word of God. What's infallible mean? Dave? Infallible means uh, it's always true. There is no, no false in it. It's always true. There is no false in it. I like that. The Bible is the inspired and infallible word of God, fully authoritative for all matters of faith and practice. What's practice referring to? Could we call that our everyday life? That's connected to our yet-to-be-lived life? Suck them together and all of a sudden you have a Christian who can think and function like Christ did. Now, another belief statement. Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, fully God and fully human, is both Lord and Savior. What is that, what is that telling us when we look at that? about God's intention. This last Mother Day, I, Mother's Day, I spoke on what God looked for in a mother for Jesus to be born. And those qualities and those characteristics that God chose in Mary were incredibly powerful, potent examples of who God is and what he wants for us and what he can do and will do for us. The Virgin Mary, right away we have an issue that requires supernatural input control, in intervention. All these things have to take place supernaturally for this woman to have the Son of God. Another belief as we go forward that Jesus Christ suffered and died on the cross. Is that the whole thing? Is that the whole statement? No, there's more. That he suffered on the cross for human sin, that he was raised bodily on the third day, and that he ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. Now, I, I meet people from time to time who talk about salvation, becoming a Christian, living as a Christian, functioning as a Christian, is based upon the crucifixion of Jesus. This says otherwise. This says there's more than just the crucifixion. There's his resurrection on the third day, his ascension to heaven, and that he sits on the right hand of God the Father. 
You ever seen somebody on TV in a church service not tell the rest of that story, not tell the end of that sentence? I think we've all seen that at some point or another. Another belief, that Jesus Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead and to reign over all things. I meet people that don't remember and don't know there is a reign over all things statement there. All they were taught is to judge the living and the dead. There's a big difference between judging living and dead and judgment and reigning over all things. In the Holy Spirit who brings sinners to repentance, who gives eternal life to believers, and who lives in them to conform them to the image of Christ. Now there's something there that is key in this one. It is the hinge point at which everything works the right way. We've been teaching about this in Bible study. I believe in the Holy Spirit who brings sinners to repentance. Do we bring us to repentance? No, the Bible's inerrant. There is no lie in it. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit brings people to repentance. I believe in the Holy Spirit who gives eternal life to believers. We can't give us eternal life. And I believe in the Holy Spirit who lives in them to conform them to the image of Jesus Christ. This isn't talking about try better, do more, work harder at being. It's not talking about those things. It's talking about the very fact that the means has been given for us to be brought in, loved, cherished, and become one of the image bearers for Christ. Now, this should be triggering some thoughts. It should be triggering some recollections, maybe about our pasts, maybe about uh, our futures that have not been written yet. In one conversation I had with a friend a few years back, the statement that uh, this gal spoke was that I was never taught this. I was only told this little piece or shown this piece. They didn't tell the whole story. They lied to me. Now I got to unprogram this. And this person's life now is in the process of being rebuilt, retaught, and reaffirmed through their faith. Another belief that Christians hold. Christians should gather in regular fellowship and live lives of faith that make evident the good news that humans enter the kingdom of God by putting their trust in Jesus Christ. By the way, the trust in Jesus Christ, which comes as the Holy Spirit giving us the ability to be transformed. So it's not our choice. We can choose to participate, but we can't choose and make ourselves a spirit-centered being. That can only come through the work of the Holy Spirit and Jesus and God the Father. I've met a lot of people, some are Christians, they say that anyway, and they say Christians should gather in regular fellowship. And that's where the sentence ends with a period. But the truth of it is, they also need to live lives of faith that make evident or show, point at, demonstrate, bring attention to the good news that humans enter the kingdom of God by putting their trust in Christ. It didn't say they enter the kingdom of God by trying a 57th time. It doesn't say they do that by working harder at praying more hours a week. It says by putting their trust in Jesus. It's another one of the core statements 
of our belief or the doctrine by which we live. I believe in the spiritual unity of all believers in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is the spiritual unity about? Why is that important? The answer is this. Unity is the togetherness of people because we're all humans, we're people. But in that togetherness, we, who we are, receive our faith from Christ. We have trust in him. We're given the changes for our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and souls. We have to only choose to participate and that unity comes into being when we come to know what it is. Now, unity is important because the spiritual body is called the spiritual body for a reason. A body has toes and feet and legs and buttocks and a tummy and abs and shoulders and arms and hands and feet. How does a body function? What makes our fingers grasp the car keys to go out and start the car and drive to the store. It is a thought process and it is a recognition that you need to do something. Now, in that, the Holy Spirit is the nervous system for the body of believers, those people that are in this kingdom on earth that is Christ's. The Holy Spirit is the nervous system that helps to provide and that puts the unity in place for all believers. I believe that salvation comes not by works. Wow, we've said that a couple of times. But only by God's grace, grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation comes not by works, but only by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ that's freely given us. Now, there's a really strong picture beginning to form here. There's one thing left that's in the foundational two hands full of beliefs that we hold as Christians, and it's this. That salvation comes not by works, but only by God's grace through the faith in Jesus Christ, and in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. That's a small handful of beliefs, but they have been distilled down from everything that's written in the Bible, the foretelling in the Old Testament, the knowing and receiving in the New Testament. And these foundational beliefs are parts, they're components to be put into our lives, to be put into our thinking, our doing, our speaking, our loving, our sharing, and uh, as a conclusion, Pastor Joe wrote this paragraph about doctrine and about foundational beliefs and about those things we personally believe in as people. Friends, I hope that these doctrines never become boring and never seem irrelevant. Granted, we human speakers can sometimes make them sound boring and irrelevant, but the doctrines themselves are vital for all of us. These are short and inspiring doctrines. I, for one, am thankful that God has given his truth that is worth teaching again and again and again as we follow the teacher, Jesus Christ. Now, going forward in the months to come, some of the things that we're going to be able to share are the deeper components that make up this two hands full of uh, basic doctrines. And we'll be able to teach these 
in a way that informs us and leaves us better able to talk with people, to share the hope that lies within us, to share the actual truth about who Christ is, and share the fact that even though they feel they have nothing to live for, one person can be changed by the truth of who Christ is. In the future, we're going to learn how to make those doctrines part of our core being, part of the root function of our life. And as we bring the life we live and connect it to the life yet to be lived, we're going to have a better focused mental view, a better focused physical understanding of how to be Christians, how to share who we are, who God is, who Jesus and the Holy Spirit are. And we will be able to stand as a light on a hill and shed that light more, shed that light longer, and be able to describe in a manner that is consistent who we live for, who we love, and who we were made for.